Lighting the chalice today is my friend Griffin. Griffin, do you want to come up? We're going to light the chalice today, the symbol of our Unitarian Universalist faith, with words from John Gibb Milspa. Leave aside the little thoughts that distract you from the depths of your soul, for this is a holy place and now is a holy time. Join with others in this room, this community of seekers, and together let us find our Sabbath. And now let's say together the words of our mission found on the screen behind me which affirm our shared purpose. Empowered by love, we transform ourselves and serve our world. Good morning. My name is Michelle Wyckoff, and my pronouns are she and her. I'm here to talk about our small group connection circles, also known as SGCCs. When I first started coming to UUCE in 2016, I'd been a Unitarian for 30 years and had been very active in my former congregation. So I knew that I would be at home here, at least spiritually. Socially, well, that was a different matter. Like a lot of other folks I've talked with, I felt awkward and uncomfortable standing by myself in the social hall during coffee hour, not knowing anybody, not talking with anybody. So I offered to make coffee on Sunday mornings, hoping that would allow me to develop some new connections. And it worked to a point. I made friends with the other people making coffee. And I was behind the kitchen counter, so I wasn't standing awkwardly in the social hall. And I was doing something, so I wasn't really uncomfortable. And people would come through the line, and they'd say good morning, or they'd say thank you. But there really wasn't an opportunity to have a conversation. And it didn't lead to the kind of connections that I was looking for. So I took a chance and joined one of the SGCCs. Um, they were known as SGMs back then. And that made all the difference. I developed meaningful relationships with a small, diverse group of people. I got to know them. They got to know me. We engaged in deep listening and sharing. Over the course of the program, we built up a great level of trust in and empathy for each other. Plus, as part of the program, we work together on a service project for the church. And that's not all. The discussion topics were intriguing, readings were inspiring, questions were thought-provoking, reflections were insightful, and the sharing of different perspectives was illuminating. I've now done a total of four SGCCs. Two of them are still going on today and one I was the facilitator for. Um, I'm now on the SGCC uh, steering committee, and I've been motivated to become even more involved here at UUCE. Um, the next round of SGCCs begins in November. Sign-ups are happening now. If you are interested in developing deeper relationships, participating in an intellectually stimulating program, serving the congregation, and getting to know yourself a little better, I encourage you to register for this worthwhile series. Dick Lesher and I will be at the back of the social hall after the service. Diana Wise will be available on Zoom to talk with you, answer any questions you might have. And uh, by the way, I'm still making coffee every Sunday. Thank you. Good morning. I'm the Reverend Dennis Reynolds, and uh, it's my great honor to serve this congregation as a community-affiliated minister, taking our UU values out into the larger community. And this morning, I'm thrilled to be home in this my church home. 
Um, I gathered here for many couple of decades before I went off to seminary, not here in this container, here up the hill where our congregation used to meet. I was ordained in this sanctuary where the call to ministry grew in volume. And it's so very good to be home. I'd like to invite us into worship this morning. Thank you. I'd like to invite us into worship this morning with the words I first heard from the Reverend Carolyn Colbert, who served this congregation for about a decade up there on the hill, was my mentor and was my beloved friend. She often began Sunday mornings with these words, we are loving and caring, yet sometimes we forget. We come together in church to remember. For our meditation today, I'm bringing a script from Ruth King. Ruth uh, King is a teacher. She's the author of a book called Mindful of Race, Transforming Racism from the Inside Out. She's the founder of the Mindful of Race Institute, and she's featured in the spring 2022 edition of Yes Magazine as one of the most powerful women of the mindfulness movement. So from Ruth King, I bring you a meditation to remember that we belong to each other. Take a moment to make yourself comfortable and still. Turn inward and close your eyes or just allow them to have a soft focus. And settle in. Notice what's happening. Attend to your body. Perhaps there's a vibration or you feel a sense of heat or your blood pulsing, or maybe as you relax into the sound of my voice, there's a calming coolness descending. Just allow the awareness to be there as you relax more into the body and the here and now. Notice the experience of settling, relaxing into each inhale and exhale. And as you soften here, connect with the stillness around you. Not the sounds that you hear if it's traffic, someone sneezing, the children's voices. But take your time and listen to the stillness in the spaces. Soften with each breath, in and out slowly, the slow inhalation and exhalation. And as you relax into this quiet space, follow my voice and follow these thoughts. May I see the world with quiet eyes May I remember that we belong to each other. If I didn't belong to you, I wouldn't be here. If you didn't belong to me, you would not have come. I am you, and you are me. Let us not forget this truth. My liberation is tied to your liberation, and your liberation is tied to my liberation. Your heart and my heart are very old friends. May we heal the seeds of separation 
inherited from our ancestors in gratitude for this life. And may our thoughts and actions be ceremonies of belonging and well-being in service to all of humanity. May we see the world with quiet eyes. Thank you, Suzanne. The promptings of the spirit that bloweth where it listeth. Those final words from our reading are drawn from the King James Bible, John 3.8. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. In modern language, the spirit wind goes where it desires, it blows, it breathes, and we know not where it come from or where it goes. We know not. As one of our contemporary hymns expresses it, mystery, mystery. Life is a riddle and a mystery. We in a free church commit ourselves individually and together in community to explore that great mystery. By the way, the King James Bible that many of us may recall from our childhood and has in so many ways shaped our culture was commissioned to affirm the power structure of its time. It seems that James I commissioned the writing of a new translation of the Bible to replace the not only somewhat clunky version used in the Anglican Church of, Eng Church of England, but also the Geneva Bible used by the Puritans, which sometimes called the question into question the very notion of the divine right of kings. Hmm, I wonder why James wanted a different Bible. James, not surprisingly, wanted such a Bible, and he commissioned the effort, which began in 1604 and was completed in 1611. A little bit of history this morning. It exceeded the king's highest expectation as the 47 scholars who did the work not only created a new translation, they crafted some of the finest poetry in the English language. Poetry aside, the Puritans who came to America in the Great Migration of 1620 to 1630 came here questioning the divine authority of royalty. Though the churches they established in the Massachusetts colony certainly were not what we would call free, their journey took steps on the path to our own free church. In particular, they lifted up that notion that was referenced called the prophethood and priesthood of all believers. It was a belief that the search for truth rests within the individual not a higher church or religious authority out there. That notion has become our current fourth principle to affirm and promote a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. James Luther Adams, the author of our reading, was perhaps one of the most significant Unitarian theologians of the 20th century. He taught both at Harvard Divinity School and my alma mater, Meadville Lombard Theological School and through his teachings and his probings, helped shape a whole generation of Unitarian and Universalist ministers and a generation to follow. Many of my professors had been students of James Luther Adams. His description of the Free Church was written as a kind of update to an equally noted affirmation written in the 19th century by Unitarian William Ellery Channing. That particular essay was entitled, The Free Mind. In Channing's day, the ideal of personal refinement was the central notion of Unitarian thought. In a time closer to our own James Luther Adam, or JLA as we call him in seminary, 
help move our faith from a focus on each individual's quest for meaning towards a focus on what we do together, not just as individuals, but as a church community. This, JL reminds us, is the core of our covenant. It binds us together and encourages us to continue to explore the mysteries of life as a collective endeavor. Such a search, what JLA calls an adventure of the spirit, is an adventure that none of us need embark on alone. In this free church, like other Unitarian Universalist churches across the land, we like gather in circles of kinship, a circle of trust. Here we find a place where we can speak and where we can be heard. Here the chorus of our separate lives resounds as one. This kind of covenant coming together is what makes our shared enterprise a church and a religion. Now, there are lots of people who would self-describe themselves as spiritual, but not religious. I would suggest we become religious when we accept that sometimes a community, a coming together, be it a Muslim mosque or a Buddhist sangha, a pagan coven, or a Christian community, or a Unitarian Universalist fellowship, offers us the greatest opportunity to explore the mysteries of the spirit when we do so together. Seeking and searching can often be done best collectively. Now, I was privileged this year in June to attend the General Assembly of the Unitarian Universalist Association in Portland in person. Since it's just a couple hours drive from Eugene and I was able to stay with family in Portland, my overall costs were relatively low. About a thousand of us attended in person, a number of you were also there with us, and twice as many logged in, some from Eugene, and about a thousand more from across the continent. As this congregation and a thousand other UU communities have discovered in these times, neither going to church nor to GA requires one to set foot in any building. At the GA Sunday worship, the Reverend Sean Neil Barron asked the question, why church? He framed this broader question of church in a more practical question his friends would often ask him, why do you go to church? Why do you go to church? In our increasingly secular world and country where decreasing numbers of Americans attend religious services, such a question surfaces more frequently. In a time when more people log into the church of the National Football League, or in other seasons, the church of the National Basketball Association, or Major League Baseball, or maybe NASCAR, or in our, reg our region, many worship at the church of the kayak, or the church of the canoe, or the church of the bicycle or the church of the wooded pathway, the church of the fishing rod. With all those other options, why do you still choose to go to church on Sunday morning? Many stay away from anything called church. Sometimes that's the result of pain inflicted in them in a judgmental and condemning church from their childhood. For many years, that was true for me. For others, especially some of our progressive and extremely rational friends, it's because the only church they know about is a doctrinarian church that calls one to measure up, to measure oneself against externally established standards of piety and conformity to see if we measure up, and to accept rules and values established by some external authority out there somewhere. Or perhaps church for them seems to be dominated by the religious right, wherein doing what that narrow theology says is the right thing to do supersedes the rights of many, especially every woman's right of choice, 
and every gay or lesbian or non-binary or gender non-conforming person's right to make the life decisions that serve them best. Unfortunately, many of our friends and neighbors know not of the free church, rather, where rather than enforcing creedal and behavior conformity, it's a church that protects against the idolatry of any human claim to absolute truth or authority. All of you who logged in today or have gathered in this sanctuary have chosen to spend your time at church. And sometimes our friends do ask us why. Why do you go to church? For years, Reverend Sean's friends would ask him that question, why do you go to church? He reports that once he became a minister, they stopped asking so frequently. <laughs> and yet he still asks himself, why church? As Reverend Sean describes it, church is the place that has broken my heart more times than any other. The beauty of its potential often obscured by the reality that churches are human, not utopian endeavors. Churches are human, not utopian endeavors. Indeed, church is a very, very human endeavor filled with human vulnerabilities and foibles and failures, along with the hope and the love. In our free church, authority, as JLA names it, with the prophethood of all believers, not higher authority, be that in an institutional hierarchy or divine power. Sometimes, though, in our church, it seems that those human foibles are even more interwoven in the fabric of our liberal faith. It can be problematic sometimes. Reverend Sean shared that, Every church I've ever been a part of has never been exactly who they claim to be and never exactly who I wanted them to be, has never been who I needed them to be. And so he asked the question, why do I go to church? He goes on to lift up the painful reality of clergy misbehavior, whether it comes from making heartfelt errors or seeking retribution or the inappropriate use of power. He spoke, too, of the unfortunate reality of people within our beloved communities who can be difficult and challenging. Yes, even here, right? <laughs> Whose communication style or habits or ingrained ways of being can rub us the wrong way, can grate like sandpaper. Yet he reports stuff and such rough and scratchy and grating contacts can be just what he needs to soften his rough edges. Why do I go to church? Why do you go to church? Why do we gather together week after week and sometimes over a period of years or decades in person or online in this thing we call church? The longer you stay in church, Reverend Sean reports, the more grief you accumulate. Grief for what was at some point in the past was your church. Grief for members and ministers and friends who have gone away, some choosing no longer to attend this church, some choosing to not go to church at all. There is, too, the grief for those who have died. While he notes that witnessing the joy of new faces can offset these losses from time to time, we look around, either here in this sanctuary, on the participants' view via Zoom, and we realize that the church one joined two years ago, or five years ago, or 10 or 20 or more years ago, is not the church you are part of today. The change to multi-platform or Zoom or YouTube church for some was an unacceptable change. And even when we come together in person wearing masks and choosing to offer and receive fewer hugs is just not the same as it was back in what we may consider the good old days. In other days. What we experience in church, whether we call it community or church, fellowship or congregation, is not and never will be the same as it was. 
And that's both a challenge and a joy. The church you are attending in person and logging into today is different in numerous ways from the church you first joined. So many changes, membership and music, ministry, and the messages shared here change. Sometimes changes are intentional and forward-looking, like this congregation's decision to purchase and renovate what has become this amazing building. All of you who are here in those times know that it was a difficult decision and a difficult journey from then to now. In the midst of all this change, the question of why we go to church continues to take on new meanings and results in a multitude of answers. In our free church, our non-creedal church, where revelation is ongoing and we and our views are continually changing and growing, the answer to why church is also, with time, transformed, both within this institution and in the hearts and minds of each of us who choose to join as passengers and participants on the journey of this pilgrim church, traveling on what J.L. called an adventure of the spirit. Reverend Sean suggests that there are a multitude of answers to that question of why church, and that they are like stars forming constellations guiding us in every season of life constellations guiding us in every season of life, guiding us perhaps towards our own true north, pointing us towards a pathway that can lead us to our being the person we truly long to be, and collectively perhaps helping to point us towards determining how we can help each other on this adventure of the spirit. Why church? Because church, because church is the place, the community, the gathering where we willingly bring our longings, our successes, and our vulnerabilities. It's where we come, be it in person or virtually, to be fed and to feed the souls of each other. Here we bring our joys and our sorrows. Here we admit our failings and discover new talents and capabilities most especially our capacity for change and even transformation. In a church community, we take comfort in knowing that as we face the obstacles that come with daily living, as we ponder and question the mysteries of this life, we do not do it alone. Why church? Because church. Because when we open our minds and our hearts to the potential of this place, this gathering, this institution, it offers the opportunity for love to become real, to be practiced, to be given, and to be received. Church is a kind of laboratory of the spirit where our experimentation in the art and craft of loving is the work we do here. In church, we find a special kind of belonging that says you are part of an unfolding story, the end of which has yet to be written. We're each of us individually and all of us together on a quest, a pilgrimage, seeking to find love and meaning and deep peace. Sometimes we find we've been part of a miraculous transformation. A group of individuals becomes a community. And we too are transformed and find that we have learned to be more open-hearted and loving. And you need not travel towards a trans such a transformation alone, for you have a people. We have shared rituals and traditions, shared history, shared ancestors, shared successes, and shared longings yet to be filled. Here in this free church, individuals to come together become a trusting and caring fellowship. Here with integrity and freedom, we are able to deconstruct rigid, rigid traditions and so doing give rise to newer, broader, and more inclusive fellowship. 
In the 21st century, we Unitarian Universalists seek to build on our traditions to create an even more open faith that assures inclusion and space at the center for everyone. In our times, in both in person and virtual gatherings, we affirm the church that never was truly was just a place, but the church was always been about its people. I'd like you to join me this morning in a simple exercise. Will your hands with the fingers up in the air, wherever you are, as you were able, and bring them together like this, okay? So that your fingers are tucked inside. Some of you may remember this old one. <laughs> Here's the church, say it with me if you know it. Here's the church, here's the steeple. Open the doors and here are the people. The people, for at its core, church is the people. Every one of you in this sanctuary on online are one people. We are church. This is not church. This is definitely not church. This is church. And perhaps in our time, that steeple, which metaphorically used to be an effort to reach the heavens, might be considered a cell phone tower that helps send the message out there. Each and every one of you are the church. We are the church. This building space or the most historic and innate, ornate old Unitarian church is merely the container in which we gather. And I want to wrap up with the words Reverend Sean shared at GA. What church can do is to make love tangible not theoretical. Join us together in one body, in church. To make love tangible, not theoretical. To join us together in one body. We, may we, together, make it so. As you go forward into the sweet day, know that wherever the winds may blow you, you do not journey alone, for you have a people, these people, your church. Go in love, go in peace. Blessed be.